Jagatai Khan wasted little time in the aftermath of the fall of Black Blight. The Kagan dispatched two full hordes of the Legion to herd the Xenos northwards, towards a series of mountain ranges dubbed the Grinders by Cartographica adepts. The goal was to corral the Orcoid mobs into the foothills and valleys, subdividing and isolating each in turn for ease of annihilation. To the rest of the Chondak system, the Kagan dispatched his troops. Each horde was assigned a planet to purge in a concentric circle spreading outwards from their current station on Chondak's prime. Thus, the first targets were the dwarf planet Kren and the shallow seas of Shalm. The orders given were blunt, for so too was the foe. Hound the orc, bleed the orc, wear down upon the orc as the river does the rock. Crush the orc like the summer storm. Jagatai himself left the white world rapidly, apparently as eager as his white scars to campaign elsewhere, unwilling to spend the duration of the campaign at camp directing grand strategy. While this would have been a curious decision had it been made by any of his brothers, the Fifth Legion, more so than most all their cousins, needed little in the way of command oversight. Once their destinations had been plotted and their objectives oathed, each detachment of White Scars would simply vanish from the body of the Legion, their fellows assured that they would return either in victory or defeat, or simply not at all. Imperial Strategos upon Chondak's prime, attending to the war camp, could but simply log the last known locations of each White Scar element and wait for word of their return. Ironically, chroniclers have theorized that it is precisely this decentralized, independent nature that rendered the lack of communication from outside the Chondax volume a thing of total lack of interest for the Scars, at least for the first several years of the campaign. Two more hordes of the Legion, diverted from Crusade far to the Galactic South, arrived shortly after the initial conflicts. From that point onwards, the Scars and their attached Imperial elements received no word from beyond the bounds of Chondax's starlight. Every single other Legion would have counted this a matter of the gravest concern. It is a sad fact of the Fifth Legion's history that this was, essentially, quite commonplace. They were rarely looked for or sought after. In many ways, the Legion was a strategic afterthought for the Divisio Militaris and the War Council for nearly two centuries. It should, of course, be noted that this worked both ways. However little faith the Imperium placed in the barbarians of Chogoris, the Fifth Legion themselves, from their days as the Star Hunters and later the White Scars, deeply disliked the necessities of status reports, logistical demands, or after-action logs, and they had a not undeserved reputation for shirking many of the essential bureaucratic responsibilities attendant to an Astartes Legion. If anything, the lack of communication from the wider Imperium was, to the White Scars, a blessing. No tremulous adepts begging for updates of ammunition usage or fuel upkeep. Those who found the time or inclination to consider the issue reasoned the dearth of astro-telepathic missives must be due to some warp storm beyond the range of the fleet's etheric sensors. Such matters were, of course, far from uncommon. Others simply reasoned that the sheer remoteness of the Chondak system was at play. It was those outside the Legion to whom the situation felt most ill. The command echelon of the Solar Auxilia was far from sanguine. Its ranking officer, Strategos Argus Gigan, made a number of official complaints about the lack of investigation to the Kagan himself. 
Jagatai, for his part, paid these little to no heed. He was, it appears, enjoying himself far too much. A grand hunt, rich with bloody abandon, was afoot. The Khan's attitude was mirrored by his legion. After the trudgery of endless parade duty, it was time for some fun. For a time, it was good. The White Scars made great sport of the orcs, inflicting a series of absolutely superlative defeats upon the foe with next to no losses incurred. However, as the months of the hunt turned to years, inconsistencies of a curious sort began to emerge. As predicted, the orcs had fractured even further after the fall of Black Blight, subdividing into rough clan groupings surrounding one or other particularly vicious big boss. What was unexpected was the degree of strategic awareness and insight all of these clans suddenly seemed to possess. While it was not uncommon for this particular Xenos strain to spontaneously create orcs with greater tactical insight than their fellows, indeed it is a literal facet of their Xenobiology, for all such warbands to display similar skills is nearly unprecedented. White Scar's Brotherhoods routinely found themselves in situations where, perched upon the precipice of annihilating an orcoid clan, they would suddenly detect another undamaged clan appearing on their flanks, forcing a retreat and redeployment. Even in the cold void between the spheres, the Fifth Legion found that the orcs were seemingly anticipating their deployments, making passage between worlds the White Scars were presently inbound towards, and forcing an ad hoc and unsatisfactory set of changes to strategy. In one especially bloody example, two of the fleet's macro hauler arcs were happened upon by orcs while refueling, causing the deaths of over 3,000 of the Seraphine Guard Exertus Imperialis Regiment. Further losses began to mount, and while loss is an accepted part of any long-term campaign, such losses are usually by and large explicable. At Chondax, this was rarely the case. The Scars were canny warriors to a man. Why then were battles that should have been essentially locked in decisive victories, turning all too often into Pyrrhic ones? Some unforeseen factor seemed to always emerge at the eleventh hour to frustrate the efforts of the White Scars. The Brotherhood of the Red Hawk, having committed the better part of a Terran standard year to prosecuting the Orc warbands on Hondural, and carefully separating each from their fellows, saw their hopes crumble when a series of unexpected earthquakes and tectonic events literally threw several clans into close geographic proximity, forcing them to unite and forming a massive warband. Across the system, in the deserts of Eshmun, the Brotherhood of the Coiled Serpent and the Brotherhood of the Star Shield pressed hard against an orcish armored horde, attempting to drive them into a defile which the Charonid Sentinels had mined with enough phosphex charges to annihilate the Xenos in their entirety. This careful planning was utterly frustrated when a smaller warband of orcs happened to stumble into this trap before the actual target could be lured there. Elsewhere, a bizarre psychic contagion appeared to be spreading from Xenos Shaman to Xenos Shaman, even going so far as to infect war bosses. This form of warp bred derangement was one the Scars were, at present, ill equipped to handle, forcing the deployment of the Silent Sisterhood demi vigil that accompanied the campaign host. The sisters, however, were few, numbering a mere 63 and were soon forced to cover most of the system as the psychic outbreaks appeared at random across the volume. Several White Scars forces, given no choice but to engage the rampaging orcs, suffered heavy casualties in bringing the warp-deranged monstrosities to heel. These delays, curious, unexpected, and inexplicable, did not, of course, stymie the overall process of the campaign. Indeed, the victories won, and their magnificence, 
tended to, at least in the short term, alleviate any ill humors the bizarre upsets may have caused. At Alkanost, Asudai Noyan Khan, assisted by Knight Centura Merovin of the Silent Sisterhood, fought a bloated orc warpseer through the depths of the world's vast caverns, a titanic hunt that Asudai's horde committed to speech and song in its aftermath. Three brotherhoods of Krennic Noyan Khan's horde fought a running battle over four days across the storm-choked plains of Terras, giving mighty chase to an orcish host mounted on ramshackle, oil-belching bikes. On Hirakon, the 5th Legion engaged in the largest armored warfare battle of its history, the Dracosans of the Saturnine Rams forming a core battalion around which whole squadrons of Legion Sicaran, Predator, and Saber battle tanks rode, taking the fight to monstrous orc war machines. Amongst them all was the Kagan, flying from battle to battle, opportunistically engaging the foe wherever he may, buoying the hearts of his men, never once shirking from the fight. Unfortunately, no matter the tally of victories, no matter the thrills and distractions of combat, those inconsistencies arose again and again. Try though he may, they could not help but vex the Kagan. Though Jagatai may have been glutting himself upon the joys of the hunt, the Khan was still master of the campaign and a seasoned general. He saw these issues, he saw their quantity and frequency, and he thought it ill. These feelings were shared amongst the command echelon, both of the legion's Noyan Khans and the strategos of the Solar Auxilia. Seven years of fighting had now passed, seven years that had seen the near extinction of the orc under the light of the Chondaxian stars, but also seven years with not a word from the Imperium. Even for the Scars, that was a level of isolation that bordered on troubling. Neither too had there been any word from the War Master, either to condemn the length of time the extermination was taking, or to offer support to his brother. Munitions and supplies were beginning to become a point of concern. No resupply barks had arrived in seven years of open warfare. What few scout vessels the Legion had dispatched to the Heliopause in attempts to break whatever seemingly mysterious interference stymied outgoing communications had simply not returned, presumed to be victims of chance orc interception. As the orc numbers bled away into the minuscule amounts, however, and as the years stretched on, the sport grew less… sporting. Purgation was becoming akin to a chore, and without the distraction of the hunt, the Kagan turned his attention to the noisome itch of these long-denied concerns. Records from the time show his perturbation drew him to conclude that there was something great and terrible afoot in the wider galaxy. Whether this was a latent premonition, like those displayed by some of his brothers, or simply the intuition of a studied and experienced mind, we do not know. But it was clear the Kagan's mind had rather quickly, as was his wont, turned to quitting the field of Chondax. He had done his duty. Brotherhoods of the Legion would remain to purge whatever greenskin pockets yet survived, but the Primarch himself and his white scars, would seek answers amongst the stars. He was owed that much, at the very least. As history, and indeed the saga of this chronicle has shown, the reasons for the unfortunate seven-year-long bad luck of the Fifth Legion had one sole cause. The Alpha Legion. The Twentieth had not merely been observing and bottling in their cousins. They had taken an active field role in seeking to negate most of the strategic wins the Scars had made. Through stealth, subterfuge, and interference, the 20th Legion had, from their hidden readouts, directed the course of the Chondax campaign in utter secrecy. Wherever the Alpha Legion observed the orcs being corralled into a trap, they sought to free the Xenos, or spring the trap early, staging raids to sabotage equipment, destabilize terrain, or redirect alien warbands. Where the White Scars had successfully managed to bait an orc clan into open warfare, 
Alpha Legion headhunters carefully assassinated key Xenos boss figures, causing the orcs to descend into infighting and denying the Fifth Legion their desired decisive engagements. Seemingly calamitous, world-altering natural disasters were in fact Alpha Legion operations designed to shift the very geography of battlefields the White Scars fought upon, upending campaign planning and forcing hasty, ad hoc decision-making. The Twentieth knew that victories must be allowed, of course. The Scars must be given enough wins to not suspect wholly outside interference. It was clinical, sinister arithmetic, with the cunning minds of the Alpha Legion's operatives bent into a game of precisely how long they could draw this conflict out. During this time, the Twentieth labored under one explicit instruction. Warmaster Horus had demanded that no White Scar legionary was to be directly harmed by the Alpha Legion. This, however, conflicted with the Twentieth Legion's open mantra of succeeding at any of their tasks, regardless of the necessities needed to be taken. There were no lengths to which the Legion of Alpharius Omegon would not go to complete their objectives, and it appears that even the Warmaster's most paramount rule was violated on numerous occasions during the clandestine part of the war. Most obviously were the examples of ships seized by the Alpha Legion. As one mentioned previously, several White Scars vessels had been dispatched to attempt to raise the Imperium via astrotelepathic or conventional communications means, all of which had disappeared. Whereas it is possible that orcs were to blame, the utter lack of any trace speaks to cleaner, more professional hands. Alpha Legion hands. Of the ship's crews, it is almost certain all were captured, interrogated for any useful information, and subsequently executed, lest they bring word of the Alpha Legion's operations back to the White Scars Legion. Additionally, numerous 5th Legion patrols were known to have vanished without any evidence of their demise. Whereas the Legion presumed ill fortune had delivered them into the hands of the Orcs, again, the sheer cleanliness of these disappearances lends credence to the theory that they were murdered by Alpha Legion headhunters, likely to prevent the discovery of some 20th Legion operation or facility. Several, however, disappeared in no proximity to any known facility or operation logged in the unbalanced scales. This has led to speculation that at least some of the killings were the result of pure malice. The malign serpent toying with its unaware prey. Two such instances are worthy of a special note, as they demonstrate the sheer degree that the Alpha Legion was willing to supersede all precedent and decency to further the cause of their assigned mission. The first of these occurred in the earliest years of the campaign, during the purgation operations of the planet Shane. Amidst the world's shallow acidic seas, Nogai Noyan Khan was waging a highly successful campaign against the orcs. More than any of his brother Khans, Nogai was an accomplished stalker of the Xenos. Deploying to full effect his hunting packs of reconnaissance legionaries and Burkhut's Claws veterans, Nogai was able to successfully isolate and trap weaker portions of the Orc Horde, bleeding the Xenos extremely effectively. Indeed, such was the speed of his campaign that he received plaudits from the Kagan, and tales of his hunt were said to have spurred other hordes to even greater feats sportingly champing at the bit to rack up the kill tallies as great as no guys. The speed was, of course, quite a threat to the plans of the Alpha Legion. Should the Noyan Khan's horde attain too much momentum, it risked rising to the point that subterfuge operations would bleed away efficacy in slowing the White Scars down. Their hands forced, eagerly or otherwise, the Alpha Legion resorted to means far more direct to address the growing problem. At the height of the conflict on Shane, the orcs had been drawn by the Scars to a battle upon the Great Western Reef, 
where the greater might of Nogai's horde set ambushes and traps. In one of these, the Noyan Khan fell. His ultimate victory was delivered, but later than originally expected, owing to the loss of his leadership. The triumph was added to the honor roll upon his death, his fall presumed to have been ill fortune catching the joyful Khan in the end. According to the unbalanced scales, however, an Alpha Legion operative under the title of Interfector had led a headhunter cadre to kill the Khan personally, ambushing him with total surprise. Occurring as it did as early as 002-M31, the death of Nogai Noyan Khan has a grim honor of being a candidate for the first instance of Legionnaires Astartes openly making war upon each other in the history of the Imperium. It, in and of itself, provided the Alpha Legion with no small amount of data in prosecuting such an engagement, something that may have swung their hands towards such direct action in the first place. Even more significant than the death of Nogai Noyan Khan were the wretched events of the Femus Massacre. Long overlooked in the annals of heresy-era glories and disasters, several scholars of note have nevertheless pointed to the affair as a potential turning point in the dark history of the Chondax campaign, a moment where the years-long conflict of hidden knives and indirect murder appeared to be coming to a distinct end. Femus was one of the host planets for a major Alpha Legion facility, a cold gas giant in the furthest reaches of the system, in a large, languid orbit around the yellow, tertiary star. In and of itself, the world held no strategic value, but the gas giant had captured in its gravity well some thirty moons, seven of which had enough atmospheric shells to support an orcoid infestation. Amongst this motley collection of Xenos clans hid the 20th Legion, utterly unbeknownst to either their Astartes cousins or the Xenos. The purgation of the orcs had been assigned to the Brotherhood of the Talon. Some six months prior to the eventual incident, the 5th Legion had begun its operations, focusing the fighting on the 2nd and 8th moons, the planet's largest. As the months progressed, the White Scars detected signs of activity on the fourth moon, a tiny and heavily volcanic orb. As the Chondax campaign appeared to be nearing completion, with much of the system utterly purged of Orcoid inhabitants, the Brotherhood of the Talon assigned elements of itself to conduct a sweep of the fourth moon to ensure that no Xenos yet survived. Unfortunately for the White Scars, the Alpha Legion facility, buried beneath the moon's surface, contained a full chapter of the 20th, designed to act as a strategic reserve for the various infiltration and sabotage operations system-wide, but also as a weapon of last resort. This chapter, seemingly risking discovery, was now forced into murderous action. The White Scars, subdivided into small hunting bands to chase the orcs present on Femus IV, were wholly unprepared for the ambushes the Alpha Legion laid for them, quickly becoming prey to their erstwhile kin. A short, utterly one-sided battle emerged in the smog-choked reaches of the moon, one of the first in history to pit legionary against legionary in open warfare. The Alpha Legion's experienced headhunters held the element of surprise in totality, deftly bringing death to the stunned Fifth Legion, Yet some few of the Brotherhood of the Talon managed to reach high ground and mount a heroic but ultimately doomed final stand. In the aftermath of the victory, and after carefully removing their own dead, the Alpha Legion triggered a series of tectonic events in the planet's unstable volcanic crust to obscure the traces of the battle, entombing the white scars beneath ash and lava. As discussed in this record, the Femus Massacre was far from the first time the Alpha Legion had viciously and clinically eliminated threats to their secrecy. What had changed was that by this point in the many years of campaign, accounting for all the curious delays, inexplicable incidents, and strange occurrences, many amongst the White Scar's command echelon were now beyond wary 
and had become actively suspicious. For the first time, a full investigation was ordered by the Primarch. The fate of the Brotherhood of the Talon was not to be left to question. A full Brotherhood of the White Scars had disappeared, hunting mere trace orc elements. Something here was utterly amiss. Within days, the Brotherhood of the Storm arrived in orbit around Femus, seeking answers. Elsewhere, the orc infestation of the Greater Chondak system had all but been destroyed. It may have seemed to the Alpha Legion's commanders, whomever they were, that there was now little left to accomplish clandestinely. This much is certainly true. There was not nearly enough orc forces remaining that the 20th could misdirect, reroute, or even protect to justify keeping the White Scars in place for any longer. This being said, there is no small amount of historical debate as to whether what occurred next was a deliberate choice on behalf of a unified Alpha Legion, or a situation obliged upon them by the actions of a potential rogue faction within the Legion itself. One raises this question because of all the early successes in the dread planning of Warmaster Horus, the Chondax affair stands as a notable failure. Horus knew precisely what was needed to corral Jagatai Khan and his White Scars, and indeed believed strongly in what would be needed to win them to his banner. What appeared misguided in the Warmaster's planning was his trust in Alpharius and the Alpha Legion. Key elements of the Warmaster's orders were wholly disregarded by the 20th. White Scars had been killed in open combat, despite Horus forbidding such action entirely. But most tellingly is what happened next. We must assume the act was deliberate. If one can be certain of one thing is that when it comes to the Alpha Legion, they don't simply err. The reasoning for their decisions may be utterly unknowable and convoluted beyond all belief, but they are always deeply deliberate. The Twentieth chose, for whatever reason, to betray the wishes of the War Master. They dropped the communications blackout, far, far earlier than Horus had intended. For the first time in seven years, the veil of silence that had wrapped the Chondak system in its embrace fell away, and all across the volume, the mouths of astropaths began to scream. This video and this channel were made possible thanks to the very kind donations and support from my Patreon subscribers. If you'd like to help support the channel, head on over to patreon.com slash oculus imperia. If you'd like to receive more updates about the channel and any future videos, you can contact me or follow me on Twitter at oculus imperia. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, comment, let me know your feedback, and as ever, thank you very much for watching.